Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our event on the Google Cloud Adoption Framework. My name is Lauren, and I'm the content manager for the Google Cloud community. Joining us today are Google Cloud technical account managers, Ratith and Steven, who will be taking us through the content and answering your questions today. Questions are encouraged, so please feel free to add those into the YouTube chat box, and we'll be sure to get to them in the chat or at the end of the presentation. We also have a few pre-submitted questions that we'll cover as well. And for any questions that we don't get to, please share them in the community, and the link to that is in the YouTube description, and we'll do our best to get to them. Either someone from the Google Cloud team or the community will be happy to respond. All right. With that, I will hand it over to the team to take us through our content today. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'll start with the introductions. Uh, my name is Steven Tolan. I am a Google Cloud Tech Help Manager with over a decade of experience working with multiple cloud providers like Google Cloud Platform. I have worked with customers of all sizes, public and private sector, all also at various stages of adopting the cloud. Rachit, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hello. My name is Rachid Kavi, and I'm a Google Cloud Technical Account Manager. I work with customers across multiple industries over the last decade, enabling them on their digital transformation journey. Great. Let's review the agenda. For the agenda, we'll start with the introduction. Then we will cover the cloud adoption themes that help you define your foundation for cloud readiness. Next, we will cover the cloud maturity scale, which helps you to evaluate the cloud adoption themes in three phases. We will then discuss how to determine your cloud maturity and also to how to define your cloud roadmap. Lastly, we'll wrap it up with some next steps in Q&A. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> Moving to the cloud offers many benefits for customers and businesses, yet there are still risks. The challenge is multidimensional and does not just focus on the solution or workload running in the cloud, but also includes the technologies that support them, the people who implement them, and the processes that govern them. The rubric of people, process, and technology is a familiar one, but how do you harness it to move forward? To start, we first should decide how far do you want to go when adopting the cloud, meaning what milestones are you trying to achieve? This may seem actually like a simple question, but it's actually very key to understand where as a whole company, business unit, or team you like to be in terms of using or adopting the cloud. In other words, what do you want this journey to achieve? Cloud could change everything, or it can simply reduce costs and make things a bit faster. Cloud could create a space for transformative interruption, or it could do what you already do today, just faster and cheaper. Ultimately, the journey you take to get to the cloud will be shaped by how ambitious your objectives are. We think of this as a scale or spectrum of your journey from tactical to strategic to transformational. Here is how we would categorize the levels of different stages or destinations in a potential cloud journey. It could be tactical. This tends to be just about moving things, moving what you already have today, but just into the cloud. This is largely technology-based. People and process may evolve a little bit, but really aren't experiencing a revolution. For example, lift and shift. If this is about migrating a VM from your on-prem into the cloud, maybe it's also about storing files on Google Cloud Storage rather than physical drive. This could also be about shutting down a data center to help with your TCO or total cost of ownership. It could also be strategic. This tends to be about changing the way you are doing things and adopting some cloud practices, but not completely restructuring and redesigning everything. This requires more of an evolution in the people and process in addition to changing the technology. For example, it could be about designing a cloud native web application and where you use cloud data platform GCP services or developing something that's called the Internet of Things, where you can leverage Google's cloud uh, uh, infrastructure that is globally reachable. Lastly, this could be a transformational. This could be about inventing new ways of doing things that would not be possible without the cloud. It is about taking your business or domain knowledge and combining it with technology to drive forward a new way of working. This requires a complete evolution of technology, people, and process. With this objective in mind, your organization will be on one of the biggest change management journeys to date. For example, this could you, you could think of an example of an insurance agency or a search, a search company that is leveraging Doc AI to standardize and digitize the legacy paper-based claim management process. It is changing the process and also inventing new ways of doing things within this industry. <clears throat> 
you should ask yourself, how do you see your cloud transition? Do you see the cloud transition as simply reducing costs with a quick ROI or return on investment with minimal disruption to IT organization? Or is it about increasing the value, the efficiency and efficacy delivered by your IT organization? Lastly, it could be about transforming your IT organization into a center of innovation and as a partner to the business. In other words, are you looking to move, change, or event? Each of these are legitimate objective in their own right. And transformational isn't the only right answer here. The answer also can be different for various stakeholders within your own company. Now, hopefully at this moment, you will have some agreement on terms of how you see the cloud transition or where you want to be. Let's also think about these other house. Everyone here probably understands that there is enormous benefits from that can come from the cloud. But the question is, how do you actually do it? We hear from customers all the time. How will I get there? This is more about the technical aspect about how the migration will occur or how the building out of a solution would occur. How will it be safe? This focuses on the security and governance aspects of things. How will I manage it? This focuses mainly about the operation model and what it'll look like. How do I get everyone to use it? This is about how you would evangelize it to get people to want to adopt the cloud rather than forcing it. These, how, these hows highlight the tried and tested consulting practice that this kind of journey is more about than just technology. It's about the people and process. It's impossible to think about the how when looking at just one of these areas alone. The how journey will involve each of these to a varying degree. It's also impossible to think about the how without the people, process, and technology. When we think about success in the cloud, it tends to be looked at through a more of an integrated lens. The rubric of people process technology is a familiar one, as well as the idea that this journey is a broader business change. And while the, this people process technology lens is a great starting point, it is really important to understand how they work together. Why, you may ask? Because it is only when you bring people and technology together that you create the skills and experience that will thrive in a cloud-first world. You only drive meaningful change by bringing people and process together with a strong mandate top down and momentum from bottom up, where you have lead both leadership and employees across your organization evangelizing and using the cloud. It is only when process and technology fit together that you can scale and see real improvements across your IT organization. And of course, in the center of everything is security. The move to the cloud for all companies always starts with security. In the cloud, it's less about shielding off the outside world and more about the right people having the right access from the right devices. Security in the cloud is evolving. It's not just about your architecture and code, but also who has access to what and what controls and who controls that access. Security sits at the heart of all three of these. Working closely with thousands of enterprise customers and helping them to adopt the cloud computing we know what really matters is the ability to learn, lead, scale, and secure. These themes are underpinned by specific measurable work streams that help you to scope and structure your cloud adoption. So not only do you have a high level framework, but you also have a map of how you get, want to get, how you get to where you want to be. So what do we mean by learn, lead, scale, and secure? Well, for learn refers to the ability to continuously learn. This, is, this could be a bottom-up approach where you, you want to upskill your team and staff so that they understand how to use the cloud. External experience comes into play where a third party like a partner or GCP will come in and help educate you about the cloud. These could be workshops, hackathons, learning sessions, et cetera. Your ability to lead is comprised of top-down and bottom-up where top-down is executive sponsorship that can cascade the right priorities down the leadership ladder with the right things like the right KPIs, proper resources, and priority. Bottom-up refers to teamwork, cross-functional collaboration. Cloud is inherently cross-functional, bringing roles like networking with data, developers, finance, and operation teams together, of course, with your leadership. You want to bring these people together to work cross-functionally as much as possible to ensure success. 
The ability to effectively scale is comprised of things like process change. You want to be able to change or control change into any system like a CI CD or continuous integration and continuous delivery. Once you have this process in place, you can start to automate things with infrastructure as code because everything in the cloud is an API. Without automation, you lose your TCO or total cost of ownership, which is a big driver for using the cloud. For architecture, we mean more about building a cloud native architecture and using things like GCP service technology so that you don't have to manage everything. You get to focus more on what you want to build rather than how you will support it or how you'll manage it. Let Google take care of that for you. Lastly, secure focuses on identity and access management, knowing who that person is or what that service is while following best practices like lease privileges, granting permission, and auditing everything. Also data management. This is about understanding what the contents are of what you are protecting. And at this point, I think I'll hand it over to Ratchet to talk about the cloud maturity scale. Thanks, Steven. So we've built this cloud adoption framework, which is an overlap of the four adoption capabilities, that is learn, lead, scale, and secure, and the measures of maturity, that is tactical, strategic, and transformational. Your readiness for success in the cloud is determined by your current business practices in each of these four themes. For each theme, those practices will fall into one of the maturity phases. We can use the framework to make an assessment of your organization's readiness and adoption of the cloud and leverage this to identify gaps in where you are now compared to where you want to be and develop new competencies to get there. Now, let's look at each theme closely and see what happens when you move from one maturity level to the next. The first capability is continuously learning. This is about both what is learned and how learning occurs. One of the biggest changes in moving into the cloud is the deep transformation in how your teams operate. Learning is no longer just about understanding how to work a new piece of technology. It needs to be transformative and not just transactional. Many traditional on-prem IT roles are typically focused on one function or one application and traditionally that get trained on changes or updates every six, every six to 12 months. Cloud offers an unparalleled learning environment in which experimentation is both low risk and cheap. So instead of annual training courses, teams should be regularly experimenting and, and playing, trying out new ideas of pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Here, a beginning state is typically where learning is mostly static and driven by self-interest to a future state where there is a culture of continuous learning and where folks can learn from each other. When we look at enablement at an organization level, we consider two aspects. Number one, upskilling your team. And number two, taking advantage of the competency and experience offered by third party consultants and partners. Now, what does tactical versus strategic versus transformational maturity mean for learning? Let's look at a few attributes. In tactical maturity, upskilling is mostly self-motivated and best effort, where team members are trying to learn on their own, leaning in on free educational resources. Maybe there's a formal training once in six months and mostly directed at siloed teams. There's usually heavy reliance on partners or consultants to deliver essential work. They have admin access to your cloud environment and hold the keys to your IT kingdom. With strategic maturity, there is usually a, a formal program for upskilling. There is a budget, there is a learning plan, and training classes are offered on a regular basis to every role that is directly or indirectly engaged in the cloud transformation. Cloud certification is encouraged. You're also opening new roles and hiring people with prior relevant cloud experience. And you're also leaning in on third party contractors or partners, mostly to provide subject matter expertise to fill in for any remaining knowledge gaps or for advanced technical topics. When we talk about transformational maturity, we're taking this to the next level where upskilling is continuous and collaborative. You have an internal center of excellence. The team is learning from each other. There are you know, lunch and learns, brown back sessions, 
uh, people participating in conferences, your team speaking at conferences. There are cloud sandbox environments where people can play and learn, and they are judicious about the usage. Here, competency is in-house, and you're leaning in on partners primarily for staff augmentation. Please note that this is not a comprehensive list, but a few examples to illustrate changes in the process and culture and tooling when we think of the different maturity levels. The next capability is uh, effectively leading. Leading is about setting a strong vision for, for the entire organization from the C-suite all the way down. By leadership, we mean both top-down executive sponsorship and the momentum generated bottom-up from your team's cross-functional collaboration. By executive sponsorship, we mean a willingness to make decisions in a timely manner and to course correct based on empirical evidence. A willingness to take the first step into the unknown and start charting a, a course to the club. Cloud transformation is also a cross-functional undertaking. As you evolve in the cloud and move towards strategic or transformational maturity, your operations and development teams are going to become more and more interwoven. Cloud can help break down the silos in your organization and to effectively leverage the benefits of that takes leadership. It takes a willingness to adapt the structures of the organization to create new job roles and redefine old ones. Let's look at a few attributes. In tactical maturity, sponsorship is mostly limited to the management of a small team where cloud adoption is being driven only in small pockets by self-motivated individuals or where the scope is limited to one or two projects. Collaboration between teams is usually limited and the outcome is usually a, a minimum viable cloud. Speaking of strategic maturity, here sponsorship extends usually to IT leadership. There are more clearly defined objectives across teams that support uh, the organization's cloud adoption. There is a cross-functional center of excellence that advocates best practices. There may even be dedicated roles of technical program managers to drive the transformation. And as we look at the transformational side, sponsorship extends to C-level, where executives down to individual contributors understand the vision of why move to cloud and the value it could provide. There is data governance and cost anomaly and control as functions of automation. Because of the democratized access to infrastructure, there's a shift towards a culture of experimentation and innovation. Teams are given autonomy and are free to experiment within their error budgets. Next, we talk about the capability of effectively scaling. Scaling is about using technology to produce repeatable, scalable, and auditable processes. One of the popular promises of cloud computing is the ability to dynamically scale your applications up. But it is not a promise that is fulfilled out of the box. It must be worked towards. That ROI doesn't materialize on day one. In cloud, uh, we look at infrastructure as being ephemeral. Everything can be recreated and repeated. You want to move towards an environment where you can easily translate activities and policies into code. This means uh, using tools like CI-CD pipelines, serverless tooling to achieve this. An organization's ability to scale in the cloud is determined by an extent to which you can abstract away the infrastructure with managed uh, services and serverless offerings. Um, let's look at a few attributes. Scaling from the tactical side, uh, here provisioning is mostly manual. Uh, code changes and releases are reviewed and controlled manually, for example, by a, a change control board. Changes are often considered high risk and deployed infrequently. The release calendar is measured in weeks or even months. There is limited use of managed services or serverless uh, offerings. With strategic maturity, we're looking at infrastructure templates being used to provision resources. Compute is designed to be immutable. 
your process and automation tooling to spin up and replace VMs or containers quickly. Deployments to production environments are executed programmatically, but may still be triggered manually. There is real-time monitoring and alerting providing insights into your application health. As we look at scaling from the transformational maturity level, we're talking about constant and continuous deployments that are executed programmatically and automatically using approaches such as blue-green deployments and canary releases. Activities and policies are translated into code, making them repeatable, scalable, and auditable. More serverless architectures in use. Um, also, managed services being used to minimize administrative overhead. There are clear service level indicators, or SLIs, uh, that are defined and mapped to your application's SLAs and SLOs, and there is comprehensive monitoring for each SLI. The last capability is uh, security, comprehensive security. Because security is so essential and it cuts across all dimensions and themes, it lives at the very center of the cloud adoption model. In the on-prem world, security was mostly about you know, building up walls around the organization. It was about keeping data inside your network secure, as well as making it accessible only from within the network. Some of the challenges with the security environment are that you know, there are different data and systems that have their own processes and access controls. So you're constantly patching up the gaps between systems. Security was often about trust, but verify. Now it is zero trust. Cloud brings together all your data and systems, giving you improved consistency and control. However, uh, even in the cloud environment, much like the on-prem world, nothing is 100% secure out of the box. It is about risk management, knowing what data you have, the criticality of the data, and who has access to what. As we look at the maturity levels, we are looking at this as a change from, you know, internet is evil and my data center is safe to everything is evil and I trust nothing. As we look at a few attributes, security from a tactical maturity level, here we would see user accounts being managed by just password alone. Your IAM policies rely on basic roles, that is owner, editor, viewer. While it is convenient to use these basic roles, they're often too broad to provide the level of secure access needed. There are default permissions that allow for any user to create GCP projects and billing accounts. Uh, the GCP admin activity and data access logs are not systematically audited. This usually focus only on the network perimeter through firewalls, but there is implicit trust inside your VPC. Uh, as we look at strategic, uh, security from a strategic maturity, here we're talking about user identities being synchronized to Google Cloud identity from a directory service like Active Directory. This helps maintain a single source of truth. All user accounts use MFA or multi-factor authentication. IAM policies use a more granular set of predefined roles. Access is provided based on least privileged principle and segregation of duties. In addition to the network perimeter security, there are additional security layers protecting your applications and individual services. As we look at security from the transformational maturity, we are looking at identity and device-centric security. Your internal firewall rules don't allow for specific IP addresses or ranges, but rather for specific service accounts. All service-to-service -service communication is authenticated and authorized. That is zero trust security. User accounts use hardware security keys for MFA. Your GCP admin activity and data access logs are regularly audited. Um, you know, we're talking about automatic alerts being configured to watch for patterns that match your threat profile. Security is not just at the perimeter, but all through the stack. Let's summarize. So we talked about GCAF and what the framework encompasses. It is underpinned by the four cloud adoption themes and provides the tools you need to A, figure out where you're today, 
to identify where you need to invest to achieve your objectives and to measure success over time. For example, in lead, do you have strong leadership buy-in but face a very siloed environment where teams are organized by function? In learn, are your teams self-taught, relying on third-party knowledge? In secure, can your teams access their work only on your private network? Or is your system structured to trust the right people rather than anyone on the private network? As we use the framework to understand where an organization is today and where they need to be, we usually see a couple of common themes. One, an organization is not equally balanced across all the four adoption themes. That is, maybe one of these is spiking to the right, that is over-investing, and or too far to the left, that is under-investing. Uh, under -investing. The other could be, all the four capabilities are not in line with your business objectives. As an example, let's say your organization's uh, objective is to be 100% greenfield cloud this year. That is, use containers, CI/CD pipelines, infrastructure as code, microservices, um, you know, continuous deployments, etc. That would be strategic ambition. But if the capabilities are tactical at best, they would cause to move a lot slower to achieve the objectives. Either the organization needs to prioritize and heavily invest to build those capabilities, that is, you know, train the teams, hire people, partners, redesign the architecture, and even rewrite the application code to achieve those objectives. Or ask if the immediate business goals you know, need to be revisited to reflect the reality of the organization's abilities currently. Example, could we look at perhaps lift and shift to cloud for now and consider re-architecting next year as the teams become more comfortable with the changes to culture and technology? That becomes a business decision. In either case, as you identify the gaps in the desired maturity versus current, you know, create a path or what we call a cloud maturity roadmap, clearly identifying ways to develop competencies and track progress. Um, I think it's worthwhile noting that some capabilities may need longer time and effort than others. This entire framework, you know, this way of assessing where you are and measuring your success, it could feel like a big project that could last forever, especially if you're just getting started with your cloud transformation journey. Uh, but it doesn't need to slow you down. Um, in fact, we recommend starting small and growing with it. Uh, pick a small use case or milestone that will A, teach you something about cloud, uh, how to build it and how to operate it, and B, uh, is valuable to the business enough that it will notice and care. Tackling achievable, achievable milestones is important to collect evidence of success in order to strengthen your case for cloud adoption and to convince other stakeholders on sidelines. So how can you get started? Uh, consider taking an assessment of your cloud maturity today by leveraging the complementary cloud capability assessment tool, which uses GCAF. Uh, the tool is available on Google Cloud website. Uh, we also have a separate webinar on the cloud capability assessment uh, on July 11th, so make sure to register for it. You can also reach out to your Google Cloud account team to help with the assessment and work with you to develop your own cloud adoption roadmap. I now pass it back to Lauren to share um, supporting resources and details on upcoming webinars. Amazing. Thank you so much, Stephen and Rachid, for this presentation and sharing this information with us. And thank you, everyone who is here joining us and for your questions. So before we dive into your questions, we did want to cover just a few uh, resources here and next steps. So on that first link, it's also in the YouTube description. Um, that is the community. So if you have future questions, you want to stay up to date on what events we have coming up next, you can join the Google Cloud community. And it's a great place to get your questions answered and to learn and engage with each other and Googlers. 
I'd uh, also recommend and really appreciate if you could submit your feedback with that second link. It's our feedback form, and I'll also drop it into the chat shortly. But this is where we'd love to hear from you what you thought of this session, ideas you have for future sessions, um, any feedback or questions that you may have. We would absolutely love to hear from you. So um, please uh, take just a moment to, to submit that. And then lastly, uh, as Rachith mentioned, we have a few upcoming events. In particular, we'll be diving into the cloud capability assessment um, on July 11th. So we did drop the link to that assessment into the chat, but we'll be taking you through that step-by-step -step and uh, providing more time for Q&A on July 11th. So uh, do check that out at that third link. Okay. So with that, um, we will start diving into some of your questions. As we said earlier, we have a few pre-submitted questions, um, and then we'll also get to those in the chat. So if you have any additional, please utilize that chat, and we'll be sure to get to it. All right, so I'm going to start with our first question, which is, how is the Google Cloud Adoption Framework different from the Cloud Adoption Framework of Azure or AWS? Is there a questionnaire similar to the AWS MRA or Azure maturity model? Yeah, um, I can take this question. Uh, so for the first part, all major cloud providers have their own perspective on the cloud adoption framework. Um, and when you, when you look closely, you may see common and a few overlapping themes. And you know, it's not surprising. GCAF is based on both Google's own experience of innovating and building out on cloud, as well as experience and feedback from thousands of enterprise customers of all scale having successfully adopted cloud. Uh, you can use the GCAF maturity scale and the capabilities with any cloud provider. The framework is technology agnostic, um, but if you'd like to ensure success, you might consider engaging uh, Google Cloud to be your guide. For the second part of the question, uh, yes, that is the cloud capability assessment tool mm -hmm. that we talked about. Um, it is available on the public website. Um, and as a reminder, um, we do have a separate webinar on cloud capability assessment on July 11th. So please do register for that. Perfect. All right, thank you. Our next question is how can a company train non-technical employees to create and use their own BigQuery and AI services in Google Cloud? I could take this one. Um, so as Ratchet uh, showed before, there's different various stages of training that you could take. To just initially start, if they're not familiar with this at all, just kind of want to get their feet wet. There are plenty of Google uh, YouTube videos out there for GCP that could talk about these particular topics and more introduction. Um, you could take a little more advanced and do some um, potential training for the cloud digital leader just to get them more familiar with the cloud technologies in general. But once they understand kind of like the benefits of using the cloud and want to focus more specifically deeper on the technology here, um, they can, you can also focus on um, on-demand training as one of our partner platforms like Cloud Skill Boost. They actually have a, a mini lecture and lab that you can self-guide, take it through. If you like more of like a, a person talking to you, but kind of pre-recorded, we also have on-demand platform trainings like or Pluralsight, which are great for pre-recorded content. Um, and then, of course, the Cloud School Boost usually gets some supplement in there for those labs. And in those um, sources, we actually have a lot of just basic introduction, 100 level uh, content, also to the more advanced training. So essentially, you go from zero to here pretty much in those type of cloud platforms or those cloud platform training solutions. Uh, also, if you have a GCP uh, account team, um, they can actually just work with you to set up some um, basic introduction sessions or even help plan a more long-term goal setting targeted training. So start with out there with free, try to get your feet wet, understand the concepts, and then uh, follow up with some more maybe on demand or even working directly with the Google Cloud team uh, if you have one today, of course. Awesome, thank you. And I will also plug a session that we have on June 29th, which is focused specifically on learning opportunities and training on Gen AI. So I would really highly recommend you check that out. It's a, a teaser session. We'll be diving deep into Gen AI um, and the opportunities that are available to you and your teams for further learning and training. So I definitely recommend you check that out. And the link is now into the chat here. So. I uh, hope to see you for that session. Also, well. one last thing I forgot to mention is uh, Google actually uh, offers quite a lot in-person public free events for you to learn about different GCP technologies. I do know here, at least where I'm based in the Bay Area, 
of Silicon Valley, there is actually another Gen I event coming up in person. This is an in-person event, but you could simply just go onto our uh, Google Events website and you can see a lot of the upcoming ones that are absolutely free, you get to meet other customers, other people who are into that technology, um, and also start networking as well. Get to know your Google Cloud uh, fellows, also uh, any other uh, companies that might be there as well. Uh, so just wanted to plug that in as that more in-person event option too as well. Awesome, perfect. All right, I am going to pivot quickly to a question from the chat on the topic of training. Um, so we have one here. Is there any training available for the cloud adoption framework in Quick Labs? I could also take this one. Um, so I think currently at the moment, we don't have something specifically in Quick Labs. Uh, it's actually now called Cloud, cloud Skills Boost today, it's kind of rebranding, but same platform. Um, I don't think we have anything specifically there, but I do know uh, there are white papers and some pre-recordings out there. Also, there is a, uh, a online self-led assessment that you could potentially do here. Uh, we do recommend working with someone who is more uh, nuanced in that particular area, like working with the Google team or even a potential partner to walk you through it. But we do also have uh, some more general training that would help in this particular area, not specifically for the framework, but just understanding how to adopt the cloud and the benefits, which is our digital uh, cloud digital leader learning path, which is also in the cloud skill boost. I believe we'll be able to plug that into the chat. And then maybe you could just also just start with getting started with Google Cloud to understand some basic concepts that are out there. Um, if you have a GCP team or potentially a, a TAM, tech account manager like myself or Ratchet, um, we can definitely help you out with working with you on the assessment. We actually run these with the customers quite often. Um, and also just to plug in for uh, a, a guided led, led assessment, it's upcoming uh, webinar that's coming up in July. That's actually a great example to get hands-on with an assessment to actually how one will be conducted and kind of the outcomes and next steps you'll get from running the assessment. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. I hope that helps answer your question. All right. So the next one we have from um, our pre-submitted questions, if you don't mind going to the next slide, Rachith. Practically speaking, what metrics are the most important for us to track when it comes to measuring the ROI on our cloud investment? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I would say same metrics that your business or organization cares about. Um, if you're looking only at TCO or total cost of ownership, that would be incomplete. You know, focus on the value. Some of the key dimensions uh, to measure on are, you know, increase efficiency, improved application performance and scalability, employ productivity, a new user acquisition, security posture, customer satisfaction. Um, impact on innovation. Now map these dimensions to your business specific metrics and compare the outcome you know, from cloud versus you know, on-prem. Uh, as an example, a FinTech company uh, doing payment processing could have a key business metric of how long it takes to process uh, a transaction. Right? They may have SLAs to their customers, also this metric could be a strategic differentiator against their competitors. Um, to achieve lower latency, you know, they need to do processing closer to the user. So this metric, that is the transaction processing time, uh, which is their business metric, could also be uh, a metric uh, to measure your investment in cloud. You know, uh, measure the metric both in cloud on-prem and then, then compare. Um, Another example could be the ability to scale. You know, consider mm -hmm. a streaming company that needs to stream high profile sporting games and events. You know, their key metrics could be how much can I scale and how fast can I scale? Mm -hmm. Like these, these become, uh, these business metrics should also become the metrics to measure the value of cloud. Great, thank you so much. All right, I think we just have a couple more questions to go through. So uh, please do utilize that chat if, if you have any others. How does the adoption framework differ if you're getting started with GCP from on-prem compared to migrating from another cloud provider? Or if you're using a combination of on-prem and multiple cloud providers? I'm, I'm happy to take this one. Um, so the nice thing is the GCAF framework is applicable across all use cases. Um, it is technology agnostic, it is vendor agnostic. The capabilities and the assessment aspects would still be relevant even in a hybrid environment. The difference could be mostly in the outcome of the assessment. 
um, if you're in early stages of migrating from on-prem to cloud, you may see your current capabilities in the tactical maturity level. And if you're moving from one cloud to another, it is possible you may already have a few capabilities in strategic or transformational level. Uh, but as that is not to say that this is always the case, an organization running on-prem may still be operating at high maturity, leveraging many of the transformational level capabilities. In our example, um, orchestrating on-prem infrastructure provisioning by code, uh, continuous deployments, you know, mature processes, et cetera. Another example I could you know, think I can think of is um, you know one of my customers migrated from another cloud service provider to GCP. They had built their application based on the other cloud provider's infrastructure architecture offering. Um, while the disparity in features across major cloud providers, there are some differences in how the technology is implemented. Um, the customer did a lift and shift uh, to GCP. And we realized that they could potentially benefit or they could potentially unlock much more scalability at lower cost if they were to re-architect their infrastructure differently uh, and make it simpler by leveraging some of the GCP native infrastructure services. In this case, they thought that they were already uh, in strategic or transformational maturity on the other cloud, uh, but uh, maybe not so on GCP. By changing the infrastructure design uh, on GCP, they could get to the, the true transformational maturity that they could not on the other cloud. Very helpful, thank you. All right, I think we have just one more or two more questions here. So which roles or individuals should be included in our COE, the center of excellence at a minimum? such as engineering, finance, or product? I could take this one. Um, so big key here for the cloud adoption framework is cross-functional. So it would pretty much would be any role that is invested or uh, using directly or indirectly the cloud. Uh, this is typically, as we listed before, networking, data, infrastructure, uh, developers, architects, operations, management, leadership, security, finance. Uh, so pretty much across the board, you want to make sure that you essentially have everyone who has some type of uh, investment, uh, either directly and directly contributing to this one to make sure that it aligns with all the business stakeholders within your organization, large and small. Could be just a few people, could be, you know, a lot more, maybe 100 people or so. You want to make sure you identify the right leaders or representatives from each group that actually has the right knowledge of that, that, that matters to them the most in terms of what their priorities are, and also be able to influence and actually collaborate with a cross uh, team. So essentially it boils down to as many, many roles within your organization that have uh, a benefit or do indirectly or as directly investments in the Google Cloud. Perfect, makes sense, thank you. All right, final call for any live questions um, as we address our last one here. When should we consider using a partner to help us? How do we know when it's outside the scope of what our team can manage on our own? I can take this one as well. Um, so in the early stages of adopting uh, the cloud, seeking outside help is actually often a good strategy, whether it be a Google partner or even our Google Cloud consulting services, uh, like your tech account manager, myself and Ratchet. Uh, but in other words, any time that you don't have any in-house expertise or real life experience, it's most likely a good, uh, very good to consider using a partner or GCP to help you out. Um, you can start with your GCP account team if you have one that can provide some light guidance um, or um, if this webinar itself, the content seems overwhelming, I would highly recommend reading the white paper just to go over thoroughly with all the information that's there and then see if a partner can still make sense for you. Um, in many cases, leveraging someone who is, has experience, either partner or GCP or the tech account manager yourself, um, will be the right Sherpa to help you guide your journey into the mountains, into the cloud. Um, mm -hmm. This is also a great way for uh, customers who have professional service credits to be able to leverage those uh, for long-term success, um, if it makes sense to actually help you out, actually implement this stuff post the assessment. And once you have like, your roadmap, um, your uh, uh, you know your KPIs and the right metrics you want to to uh, accomplish, Google can actually help you that uh, accomplish those goals short-term, long-term as well uh, to make sure your success is today and also in the future. 
Amazing. All right. Well, thank you. I think that covers all of the uh, at least pre-submitted questions that we received. Um, if you do have any others that we're not able to get to, um, you have that link to the community in the YouTube description. So please uh, utilize that. We are here to help and we appreciate you joining us today. I'll just pull up our, our next steps and resources slide as one final reminder here. And if you do get a chance, it'll just take less than a minute for you to let us know what you thought of this event today with our feedback form um, that will drop into the chat shortly. But before closing out today, Stephen, Richie, thank you so much for your presentation, for sharing this information. Do you have any final thoughts or recommendations before we close out today? Uh, other than just uh, use the assessment, if it makes sense for you to help set you up for long-term success, uh, check out any of our upcoming webinars, as Lauren just pointed out. Uh, we are here to help, and we are very, very uh, eager to uh, ensure success for our customers long-term and short-term as much as possible. Yeah, plus one to everything that Stephen said. Um, you know, please do uh, sign up for um, future webinars uh, and keep your questions coming. Hope this session was useful. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you all, and I hope to see you next time. Appreciate it.